Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. So good to see each and everyone out in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Now the birth of the church is today. Amen. So, uh, but we're just so glad you're here. We want to go before the Lord first in some prayer. And uh, I do want to just encourage you here in a little bit. We will be having our altar of prayer. So when we do, we just love our elders and our prayer team to be ready and to come on when we pray. Uh, sisters, um, uh, 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 yeah, there we go. That's how that works. Sorry. Uh, Flavia has a wonderful friend in Brazil, Jonathan, who his mother, Sarah, needs your prayer this morning. In uh, Brazil, like in America, they've had such a horrible uh, time with COVID and things like that, but his mother uh, is, uh, they're pumping 100% oxygen, and she's only being able to process about 80%, 82% of that, and uh, they're saying that if she does not recover soon, that they'll just, they'll just have to wean her down, so uh, please remember uh, them there in Brazil. Also continue to remember many others uh, that may be sick. We pray this morning, of course, for Jennifer and and uh, we just ask the Lord to just give her a special touch. Sister Jennifer Shepherd, let's lift her up before the Lord. Um, also, there was someone else I know we prayed for Sunday morning. Let's remember Kathy Warren. I don't know if anyone has heard from her, but I know her. she's been very sick. So let's just lift her up in prayer. Went to see them last week, and they seem to be feeling some better. So let's just continue to lift her up in prayer. Amen. Also, let's continue to remember uh, Brother Scott up when you pray. Uh, Sister, uh, would you give us an update on? On, on Brother Scott, amen. Amen. Let's continue to lift him up in prayer. Amen. Anyone with a special request, let me know by raising your hand this morning. God sees those and understands. Let's all stand to our feet and we'll go before the Lord in prayer together. Amen. Pentecost Sunday again is a reminder where the power of heaven came to reside upon the earth. Amen. And not only in Jesus, but in every believer who will just attest. Amen. I love what the scriptures remind us is that this gift is for your children, your children's children, any as many as is far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In family of faith, there's a purpose. If there's a power, there's a purpose. Can I hear an amen? amen. So today we're going to be talking about that purpose, and it is the harvest of souls. So uh, let's point our hands this way. Let's just go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these requests that's been given, but also those that's so dear and precious. God, only you know them. You understand them. And God, we just go before you, knowing you're able, Lord. So God, would you touch the request that's been given, those who have not, and Lord, will never cease to give you the honor and the praise and the glory. And can everyone say, Amen. Amen. Look at that neighbor and welcome someone to the house of God here this morning. As we're standing, I do want to just remind folks that tonight at 5 o'clock at the Rogersville Park, we're having our second annual uh, uh, Better Together service, amen? And this one is dedicated to the day of Pentecost. What an incredible opportunity we've been given to share Pentecost with our community, amen? And how many knows that the gifts of God is not given to divide the church, but to empower the church, amen? 
So it doesn't matter where someone comes from, their background, their understanding. And it's not tonight and today we're not talking about the evidences. We're talking about the gift, he himself, the Holy Spirit. So here this morning, I just want to sing a song. Let's get to worship. How many knows the day is the day? Amen. The world may say that it's not a good one, but we know who believe in Jesus today's the best day. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I won't worry about tomorrow. Trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Amen. Let's put our cares aside. Come on, family. We're putting my fears. Today is the day. Today is the day. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. Well, what can wash away? No. 
If our prayer team would just come at this time, amen. Praise the Lord. We want to offer prayer to those. You know, the book of James says, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Amen. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and if there be any sins, they'll be forgiven. We have one, of course, Sister Zena. Would you come and stand in for Jennifer this morning? And Amen. How many believes if we do it God's way, we can expect a God result? Amen. So we know there's more. Praise the Lord, it would come. Praise the Lord. We'll give you just a moment this morning. Just a moment this morning. Praise the Lord. He is able. He is able. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. There is a river whose streams make a light to see.
sing that chorus again. Cause there is a fountain It's full of grace And it flows From Emmanuel's veins There is a fountain It's full of grace And it flows From Emmanuel's veins in the house of God here today. Amen. Amen. God is good and all the time. Amen. You may be seated. If you are between the ages of five and nine, amen, you get to go to children's church with my hot little wife. Amen. Well, I'm speaking the truth and love, sister. Amen. Praise the Lord. I got to dance with her last night, too, at the kids prom amen praise the lord Woo! listen you go to a prom and your wife or your husband's there and you don't dance that's your own fault come on somebody i've always determined the lord would rather me live life and love the life i live than to live it like i've sucked on a persimmon all day long because you're really going to win the loss to jesus by going i'm saved you know i mean i just don't see that but we had a great time. I do want to thank you for praying for my babies. And, and uh, Kara graduated high school. Then her prom was last night. And her and Christian had a good time. I mean, some of the others that were there had a good time. But your pastor got to play DJ. Amen. One of the ladies that was, or the gentleman that was supposed to be the DJ, uh, wasn't there. So they handed, I mean, imagine that. They handed the controls to me. Amen. But I'll tell you what, being a DJ at a prom lets you know how old you are and how old you are quick. Because, you know, I'm an 80s baby, so I reverted back to a little journey, you know, through a little, you know. Because, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're not singing praise and worship, if you sing Don't Stop Believing, I mean, that's you're sort of halfway in the middle, okay? So I put that in there, baby, and everybody looked like, what's that? So I knew I was, I was in, indifferent. So my, my, my daughter helped me, Kaylin helped me, and and but we all had a wonderful time. And uh, like I said, the Christian people should be the happiest people on planet earth. Amen. I've read the back of that book, honey. We win. And I know the Bible says it many of our afflictions. But how many knows the rest of that scripture says, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. I'm so excited to share this word with you. I am thrilled. Amen. Uh, at Pentecost is the, the representation of the harvest, but it's a representation of the power of heaven given to earth. We know that what Jesus walked around and did. See, Jesus said this very precarious uh, uh, statement. He said, I go to my Father, and it's good for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Comforter won't come. And he also says that the works that I do, greater will you do because I go to the Father. You see, the thing is, family, God doesn't give us God-sized challenges that we can do them ourselves. But he gives us challenges in our life that we can only do with his help. 
That's why we know they're from the Lord. Can I hear an amen? So turn with me, if you would, here this morning to the book of Acts chapter 1. We're going to read Acts 1, 1 through 8. When you find Acts chapter 1, 1 through 8, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God? And I tell you this all the time, I'll read fast, you listen quick, and we'll end together. Amen. So when you have it, say amen. All right, some of you standing. Remember, you're not standing in reverence to Stephen. I, don't, I do not deserve any reverence, but this is just to the Word of the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in verse 1 in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. We got to see that. That was the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And verse 7, He says to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set in his own authority, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I want to preach just a few moments here this morning on the thought of from the seat to the street. Amen. Could you point your hand this way and let's go before the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you do and all that you are. We have felt your presence. God, there is something mighty you're doing in Crossroads. There's something mighty you want of us, O Lord, and we're striving to do so. So today, O Lord, I pray our hearts would be ready, our minds would be alert, and our spirits would be receptive to what the Spirit is telling us. And Lord, may the same Holy Spirit that inspired the authors of old, that spoke through the Lord Jesus Christ, that God empowered the apostles of old, would again whisper to our hearts that we could understand your word. And not only understand your word, but be doers of your word. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, and can we all say... Amen. You may be seated. A lot is going on in 50 days. We know that Pentecost just means that. It means 50th. And we know that it was 50 days from the time of, of, of the Passover unto the time of Pentecost, the first fruits, the celebration. Amen. But in the last 40 days of the disciples, after the resurrection of the Lord, we know that Jesus had shown himself to many. In 40 days, he appeared to the disciples. He loved Thomas back to faith. He ate meals with them. He walked with them. He talked with them. But now he's giving them this incredible statement. And he's telling them, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be with you as I have been before. Now they're having to depend not upon the physicalness of Jesus, but to believe by grace through faith on the promises that he's made. And the thing that I want to share with you this morning is Jesus doesn't just lift our hopes. He fulfills his promise. Somebody needs to know the difference. Your hope is sometimes when you conjure what you want Jesus to do. You hope he will. But if Jesus has promised that I will, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. And we know that Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. But I'm going to go and pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter. Now, ten days had passed to what Jesus, after he had ascended. And, you know, in that ten days that they had left, you know, we learned last week in the book of Luke that they returned two miles back to Jerusalem, and they stayed there in the temple, and they rejoiced. But... Could you imagine what it was like for them in the temple when they came back? Don't you believe that, that the, they could hear the snickering and the snide as they said, Oh, they're the ones that followed the dead Nazarene. Oh, they're the ones that believed that guy was really the Messiah. Oh, who you mean Jesus, that blasphemer, that herald, her, you believe him? You have to understand, they were not accepted when they came back uh, into Jerusalem. They were part of a failing ministry, part of a failing a part of a, a, a problem community that now finally their, their leader, Jesus, was out of the way. But how many knows he wasn't out of the way either? 
And as a matter of fact, we know in just a few moments, the promise of Jesus was going to take the fear of the disciples and breed faith in them. In that upper room, before the crucifixion, Jesus could have taught anything. We know in the book of John, chapter 14 through John, chapter 16, is the last main message that Jesus carries to his disciples before his crucifixion. Now, he could have told them fellowship. He could have told them a lot of things. He could have explained many mysteries. But in the latter part of that book, he begins to tell them about the Holy Spirit. For you and I, what should that indicate? That should indicate that he is important and should not be overlooked. The sad thing is, I was talking to a dear pastor friend of mine who pastors an amazing church in Morristown. He asked me, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I shared with him. He said, well, I want to tell you I'm proud of you, preacher. I said, why? He said, because many churches this morning will open their doors, and although it is Pentecost Sunday, the message of Pentecost will never be preached. Because people look at the initial evidence or the strangeness of the gifts and mark that off and never research the power of God to be added to our life. It amazes me that you have Methodists who will say a great amen, and we consider that normal. We'll have great Southern Baptists who might even give us a little hallelujah. We might even have the wonderful primitive Baptist sister who in the back of the church, when the spirit hits her, lets a squeal out that makes the hair stand up on your head. And we'll mark it and say, oh, the spirit just moved. But why is it, although those are beyond our understanding, but we'll never doubt them, when we see the moving of the Holy Spirit among us, some outside that have never seen it go, oh, that can't be of the Lord. When you can explain to me everything that is of the Lord, maybe you need to preach and I need to sit down. Because the promise of God was so amazing. Well, what was it that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked. I wish I could tell you this morning this is from me, but actually I took an excerpt from one of Brother Rick Renner. And his messages, if you ever enjoy uh, being able to discern the Greek and the Aramaic and how it, how it works through Scripture, he's an amazing teacher from the wonderful city of Moscow, Russia. Amen. But anyway, as we look, we know that in John 14, 16, that Jesus said that he would be our comforter and he would comfort us. Now, that's not a comfort like the comforter that you pull up at home and get all snugly and cuddly with. But what he means by the comforter, according to the Greek, is the parakletos, the paraclete, the call alongside one. Brother Renner said it's suggestive of a, a leader who goes into a city and you need a tour guide. And that tour guide leads you and shows you uh, where the good places are and the bad places are and, and tells you where it's good to eat and bad to eat. See, we've got to realize that as Jesus led the disciple in the will of God, when he ascended into the Father, now the Holy Spirit guides us in ways of truth and comes aside of us so that we're never alone. We know that in John 14, 17, that he dwells permanently in us. Now, for some of my brothers and sisters, what are you saying, Brother Kimber? You're saying that I'm, I'm telling you now, some did believe differently here, but we do believe that you can forfeit your salvation. And I just hear the gasp of intellect. <gasps> I wasn't taught that way. Well, that's okay. You read the Word of God, pray the Holy Spirit, you receive what you feel. But I believe you can't lose it like you lose your car keys. But if you return to the sin in which the Lord led you out of, according to Scripture, it's the proverb, the pig has went back to the swallower and the dog has returned to his vomit. But the Holy Spirit was not intended to be temporary in your life. When God wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, thank God the blotter was not in his left pocket. When you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, thank God he didn't have a back door. I want you to know that what God has instilled and to do for you was to do to the rest of your life. And the only time that that Spirit exits this body is when we exit it and the Lord says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Then again, same family of God, we've won the race. But until then... He's a permanent resident in your heart in my life. John 14, 26, he teaches us. Come on, aren't you glad he teaches us? You ever been reading the Word of God and all of a sudden somebody told you something a long time ago and you actually get in the Word and you say, whoa, that ain't in there. Maybe I need to revisit this. Thank God for his Holy Spirit. I like what one particular writer said. He said that the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, that he inspired the writers to write. And when we open the Word of God, it's the same Holy Spirit that whispers its understanding. In John 14, 26, he's the reminder. 
Praise God, the Holy Spirit, when you need to know something, He'll remind you. Now, kids, that don't mean you can not pretend, not pay attention in school, pray in the Holy Spirit before taking the test, and He'll remind you of everything. That's not what He's saying. But what He's saying here is, is when you're tested and tried, and somebody asks you for the reason of the hope that's within you, the Holy Spirit loves to show up and whisper those things you thought you didn't know. But he brings back in the recourses so that you can testify the goodness of the Lord. John 15, 26. He testifies with us and through us. You're not alone when somebody asks you what you believe. You're not alone when you want to tell somebody about God's goodness. Come on, somebody. Oh, he's there strengthening you, helping you, loving you, encouraging you. John 16, 9. He comes to convict us of sin. Thank you, Lord. It's not a personal thing. It's a parental thing. I've never met a good parent that didn't tell their kid when to stop. And the Holy Spirit works in your life and mine. Sometimes you say, well, Brother Kim, it's not written. Well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And when you do it, he says, no, no. Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? We find also that in John 16, 10, he comes to convince us of righteousness. Oh, Brother Kimry, I wish I knew I was saved. Well, you pray and let the Holy Spirit edify something in you to where you know or knows. I know that's old country language. Some of you don't understand. But I want you to know that the Lord wants you to know that you're His from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You see, family, I may forget. My dad's been dead for now. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away in, in uh, oh goodness, in 1999. I'm facing my 21st year without my earthly dad. But guess what? I don't have to wait too long. I hear his voice come out of my lips. I do the things that he used to do. And sometimes I think the things he used to say. Let me tell you something. The Lord may be in heaven, but when the Holy Spirit shows up, I get to act just like him. Yes. Oh, I wish somebody was hearing me this morning. Amen. John 16, 13, he guides us. In John 16, 13, again, he reveals to us. In John 16, 14, he helps us worship. You see, family, we get it messed up about worship. We call worship worthship. Well, you know, if he's been good to me, I'll say amen. But, oh, family of faith, I want you to know worship, if it doesn't cost you anything, then it's not worship. My mind goes back to David when David was there in the threshing floor that God called. God's judgment was upon David, and God said, I want that threshing floor, and I want you to make me an offer, an altar. Not because God needed another four or God needed another stick of wood, but he needed David's heart. All of a sudden, we know he goes to the owner of the threshing floor, and King David says, I need this for the Lord. And the guy says, listen, you're the king, I give it to you. But David, a man likened unto God's own heart, says, I cannot give God something that costs me nothing. Yeah, and some of us, what reason we don't get filled up with the Holy Spirit is we give out of our excess and what's left over, not out of our first part. Mm. That's, what, that's what harvest is about. That's what Pentecost celebrates. Not giving what's left over, but giving the first part. Come on, somebody. Amen. Acts 2, we find on the day of Pentecost when it was fully come. This was the festival of harvest, the festival of first fruits. As a matter of fact, it was a Jewish festival called the Shavat. It was primarily a day of thanksgiving for the first fruits of the harvest. And later we know that it was the day that was celebrated for the law given to Moses at Mount Sinai. A double whammy to where God's law is given, but also we celebrate what God has blessed us with. You see, family of faith, God's always been about the first part. Because imagine how many of you wives would look at your husband, and when they bring that check home, or your wife, if you bring that check home, and then what's left over, they said, here, baby, have a happy meal. You're going to think, no, nah, they don't really love me too much. But what if they come to you and they say, not because you've asked it, but honey, I love you. Before I do anything else, can I get you anything? You see, God don't need your money. He wants your heart, and the rest will follow. Amen. We find that even Achan in the Old Testament, when, they were, when the children of Israel would come and they, they conquered the land, it wasn't because Achan hid the gold only, but Achan, did, he hid the first fruit. God's about the first fruit. So we find here that all of a sudden they have this incredible ceremony, 50 days since Passover. And could you imagine what the disciples must have felt? They've already been ridiculed. Now more and more and more people are coming to the city. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2. In verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly the sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be clothes of fire that separated and claimed to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Other, different languages. As a matter of fact, we find that there was more than 14 languages, different languages that was represented that day. And 14 languages cascaded from lips that had never studied nor even tried to understand other languages. But God gave this to them. These Galileans had never studied. As a matter of fact, we know not much about the 120. But 11 of them we know were tax collectors and we know they were fishermen. They were not linguists. Those that day heard their own language, these Galileans speaking their own language. And what they heard may have been a mystery, but what was really going on in the, the heavenlies is the sound of the sickle going through the wheat. It's about the harvest. Some wasn't understanding what they were saying and some were mocking. You know what amazes me? We in America are so arrogant sometimes. We can have somebody that speaks four languages and because they have a little accent, we say they're ignorant. Well, let me tell you, some of you speak only English. You don't speak that well either. Come on now. But we know this particular bunch of folks, they were listening and they heard these languages and they didn't understand. And it's our human nature, what we don't understand, we mock and make fun of. Family of faith, we've got a world that don't understand how we that are Christians can believe in a God in which we can't see, believe in a God who can heal who while we still are sick, who believe in a God who redeems while there's still some that are lost. We have a God that we love, but the world looks at the love of our God and considers it hate simply because he tells us and gives us guidelines and what to do. We live in a society, it amazes me, they don't believe in the heaven that we believe in, nor the God that we serve, but because we believe our God, which they don't believe in, and the heaven that they don't believe in, they can't get there unless they follow the word they hate us to. Makes no sense. Unless we really realize that there's more to this heaven and salvation than even the atheist wants to acknowledge. Come on now. Why would they fight us if there was nothing to us? They didn't fight many when they stood up and said, we're one-eyed, one horn flying purple people eater going to outer space. <laughs> they laughed them off and mocked them off. But for us, we still disturb the world. It amazes me right now in Israel, the bombings that's going on from Palestine to Israel to Palestine, that Israel is less than a city mass or a state mass, less than the, the size of Florida, but the whole world is on its ear to see what it's going to do. Don't tell me God don't have his hand on them. Family of faith, God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, but now that his son returned to the throne of heaven where he belongs, now something has to be done with his people. And as they're mocking and as they're laughing, then we get to actually see the result of the infilling. As Peter, who had once been this, 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 this fearful and, and backward person now, proclaims the gospel. The Bible says in Acts 2, 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose because it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what's spoken about in the prophet Joel. And then for the next few verses, he begins to quote Joel and, and verbatim what the prophet said. I've never read in the New Testament where that Jesus got the scrolls and gave them Bible lessons. But I did read in John 14 where Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance. Peter went from a man who denied Jesus three times. He went to go fishing in the upper room. He's the one that tried to kill the, the, the soldier in the garden. But this is the same man who stood up without any reservation and spoke the gospel un, undeniably to the thousands. No more fear, no more excuses, no more backing up. He became spirit-empowered. And when you're spirit-empowered and have a message, you can't help but overcome fear. You see, family, I'm just afraid that we in Pentecost have really messed up when, on the understanding of what he's for. We've come and got prayed for the anointing of the Holy Spirit so we'd feel better, feel more excited, shout louder, run faster, holler quicker. But family, if we don't have the harvest in mind, then we're fooling ourselves. I made this illustration last week, and I've got to, Ill, to, to do it again. But sometimes we, as our Christian experience, is like Cracker Barrel. We're full of the implements of harvest, but all they do is, is on our walls, and they tell a story, but they're collecting dust. 
Saints of God, God wants our sickles and our harvesters for the world. That when we meet heaven, when we reach that precious place, that that sickle is worn from use, that we are sweating from the profuseness of the harvest field, not sitting on our cushions waiting for heaven to come to us. Well, Brother Kimray, what am I supposed to do? Well, Peter, we know, was in the right place at the right time to preach. Now, I know what I'm going to say is going to ruffle some feathers, and some are going to get really mad at me. But we used to have days of, corner, of preaching on the square. Now, the traditional me says, bless God, that's wonderful. I hate they let it go. But the realistic me in the 2021 me says, that's not a bad thing. The world expects us to scream at them and tell them how bad they are. Remember, being saved or even being spirit-filled doesn't mean that I'm someone you have to be like. I'm not saying they weren't obedient, and maybe you preached on the corner, and God bless you. But listen, family of faith, we may win some fish by slapping the water, but guess what? God doesn't always call us to throw the dynamite in. Sometimes he just wants us to walk alongside somebody that's going through the same stuff, but yet we've got some joy that they would love to have in their life. Someone once said, you don't need the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. That's right, but you might need him to go to Walmart. You see, the problem with us Pentecostals is we thought the Holy Ghost was all about an inward empowerment. It's not. It's about the harvest. We don't want to go across the street because we're afraid. It's okay to be afraid. We are all are. Peter was. But when he was in fear of the Spirit, fear had to melt when faith rose up in him. Amen. We find that in the next few verses, 22 through 36, that Peter begins to preach who Jesus is. I, mean, I want you to know that I know the Holy Spirit just wants to tell the world who Jesus is. He wants to reveal to them the reality of who Jesus is. And you've got to realize that when Peter began to step up and preach, he wasn't preaching to just any crowd. He was preaching to the ones that just a few weeks ago was screaming, crucify him. He was preaching to the ones just a few weeks ago that said, give us Jesus or crucify Jesus and give us Barabbas. He was preaching to the same crowd that when Jesus was broken and whipped and beaten and walking the Via Della Rosa with the cross member across his back, they were the ones mocking and laughing at him. But now Peter who had run away and said three times, I never knew the man. Now because of the power that's in him, is telling him exactly what they did, who Jesus is, but that Jesus still loves them. You see, the world don't need to know you're right. They just need to know Jesus. See, I had a mama that loved her family. She loved them. But I wish I could have talked to mom 30 years ago and shared with her how to witness her family. I can remember sisters who would come to the house and all they wanted to do was love on mama but mama took this word because she was very concerned about my sister's eternity and instead of this being a Bible it become a club so when they walked in the house she thought she was doing God right and she began to tell them how bad they were and they should be ashamed of themselves and they should come back to church they couldn't even come in and have lunch it's not what the Holy Ghost is for Some of us are afraid that we have to do the things that are impossible. Listen, honey, God's going to do what God wants to do. You do the possible and let him do the impossible. Peter, I don't know how he preached. I try to think he was a little bit southern. Let me tell you why. I was doing a wedding here a couple of weeks ago. Zach and Faith Walker, precious folks. Zach's grandfather uh, was, was an Assembly of God pastor from up north, and he married a beautiful Brazilian woman. And my wonderful Brazilian friends taught me a wonderful Brazilian hello bon dia so I walked up to her and I thought they would be so proud bon dia and she started snickering <laughs> I said didn't I say it right she said yes you said it perfectly but it sounds so southern <laughs> yeah. I tried to speak fluent Portuguese, but it came out as old hillbilly hick. Come on now. 
What are you saying, Brother Stephen? Listen, we've got to let the Lord do the work on the inside. May God help us. The Holy Spirit's not to isolate you so you can't love them on the outside. You'll never win somebody to Jesus you can't put your arm around. You'll never win and encourage somebody to come back to Jesus when you don't love them. And sometimes we need the Holy Ghost just to be able to put an arm around somebody that's hurt us or said things about us or that that child. See, nobody's going to hurt you like your children because you expect more of them. But listen, Mama, listen, Daddy. If they don't know you love them, they're not going to listen to you. But Peter begins to preach this gospel. And we never see, although he tells about Jesus and he says, you're the ones that crucified him. He made the truth relative to them, but he never said, well, y'all going to hell. And then after he gets done preaching, verse 37. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Oh, thank God for conviction of sin. And Peter replied, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of sins, of your sins. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit and the promises of you and your children and all who are far off, even whom the Lord your God will call. What's he saying? First, he's not giving a formula. He's giving a directive. He says repent. The word repent basically just means turning away, turning around. You can repent all day, but if you don't stop your action, that's not repent. That's just apologizing. Oh, oh, oh. i got to dig in a minute. Hold on. If I'm truly repentant, it means I changed what I just did. If I'm only apologizing to you because I got caught, if you turn your head, I'll do it again. Peter said, if you're going to serve this Jesus, you've got to repent. You've got to live different. You've got to talk different. You've got to walk different. Secondly, he said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Now, don't get all strung up and say, oh, in the name of, that's the form. though. No, Jesus gave the form in Max 28, 19. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triunity of God. But here he's saying, who gives you the authority to baptize? Because listen, before Jesus, Matthew was a tax collector. Peter was nothing but a fisherman. The twin boys were fishermen. Come on now. They had no business baptizing. They were not leaders of anything. But now when somebody says, why are you in the water? He said, because I'm doing what Jesus told me to do. I'm the name of. I'm the authority of. You know, that's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray in my name. Why do we pray in the name? In the authority of. Because when heaven hears his name, all heaven glistens. Come on now. Repent, be baptized, and then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Family, we need the empowerment of God because God's called us to do things we cannot do on our own. Verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. We have to be separate people. We have to be called out. Like I mentioned earlier, it ain't about having fun. Come on, somebody. You know when you sin and you have fun, there's a line. If it breaks this word, it ain't fun, it's sin. Like some of these crazy folks that get up on the Eiffel Tower and jump off with a parachute. Honey, that ain't forked, that's crazy. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit guide you, trust me. If you have any questions, well, Brother Kimry, should I do this or shouldn't I? The, probably the Holy Spirit's already told you. You ever had somebody want just you to agree with them? The Holy Spirit's done told them, they're waiting for somebody to agree with them. And they always line it up now, brother. <laughs> this doesn't hurt anybody, does it? Well, what's the Holy Spirit telling you? Well, now let's talk about it some more. Oh, come on. Verse 41. Those who accepted his message and were baptized were about 3,000 souls and added to their number that day. My gosh, what a revival. Peter, who couldn't preach to one, now preached to thousands. These disciples who run from one now have ministered to thousands. 3,000 souls added the kingdom in one day. You see, the word Pentecost and the festival of Pentecost was not only about harvest, it was about the time that God gave his, 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 his message, his Ten Commandments to Moses on, Mount, Moses on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 32 and 28, we find that those rascals, when the, Moses came down after many days, they were back to the sins they had in Egypt. And the judgment of God, because God is righteous, just absolutely obliterated. And 3,000 people died that day because of their sin. 
Fast forward a few thousand years now, after the hill of Golgotha, Jesus dies on the cross, the Holy Spirit comes now, instead of 3,000 dead, when the gospel spirit message hits, 3,000 of them alive in Jesus Christ. See, family, I tell you, the law is death, but the spirit is life. Come on, somebody. The law tells me what not to, the spirit helps me not to do it. Come on, somebody. Pentecost was not about division, but about salvation. So the apostles, we get to see what happens when someone full of the Holy Spirit preaches the gospel. Well, some of you say, well, Brother Stephen, what is Pentecost about? And don't get me wrong, we're going, we're going to do some stuff here in the next few weeks, and I'll talk about our, our, our doctrinal directives, and I'll talk about tongues and interpretation of tongues. And we'll talk about some of that because it's very important. But before we get caught up in the evidences, we need to get into the purpose. And the purpose isn't how big our churches can get, but how much our churches can get. <laughs> it's about the harvest. As a matter of fact, if I, we read the scriptures, Jesus, not many days from his crucifixion, looks at his wonderful disciples. In John 4, 35 through 30. All of a sudden he looks at them and they're just proud of what they've done in his name. And then all of a sudden he says, don't say that there's still four months till harvest. I tell you, look up, lift your eyes and look to the fields where they are ripe for harvest. One translation says they're white, like white for harvest. If you know anything about wheat, when that wheat kernel turns white, it means it's almost the point of rot. And if you don't get it off, it, or if you don't cut it, if you don't harvest it, it will die. Family of faith, the problem with the Pentecostal church and all churches, we look for the seasons to change before the harvest begins. But the harvest is already ready. It's in the spirit realm. Let me tell you something. The physical, you can't harvest in spring, and you can't harvest in the winter. But let me tell you something. In all seasons, you can harvest for the kingdom of heaven. You say, how so? When I was a younger man, I worked for DTR Tennessee, wonderful Japanese-owned automotive company in, in Mossan, Tennessee. Now it's Sumi Riku. It may change again. I don't know. But I can remember I'd worked my way up, and I was a material handler. I drove a fork truck. I enjoyed that fork truck. But when people began to understand that I was a pastor and I was silly enough, they would stop me. I dropped their materials off at their, their, their machine, and all of a sudden they'd say, Stephen, come here. I'd say, what? They say, man, my wife's sick, would you pray for her? My husband's sick, would you pray for, for him? I mean, it was a lot of things like that. So finally one day, my human resource director, Cal Doty, calls me in the office. And he says, Stephen, I've got to talk to you. I said, okay. We sat down. He said, Stephen, I know you've been stopping and talking to a lot of people in the line. So I wanted to have to tell you this, but we, called, we hired you to be a fork truck driver, not to be the pastor of DTR, if you understand. And I said, yes, sir, I understand. He was exactly right. What do you mean right? Because you know what? God called us to harvest. And there's rules to harvest. You've got to obey those who are over you. And he's over me. And I understood I had to be careful because I wanted to hear people's needs. But I'm not their pastor here. So I told him, yes, sir, and thank you, sir. And I appreciate it. And, and I'm sorry. And, want, and I tried my best. To honor that. And by doing so, God gave me favor. Because it wasn't too many weeks later, or maybe a year later, that I got called back into his office. And I'm thinking, Lord, what have I done this time? <laughs> and he says, come in here. I said, what? He said, I had an issue last night, and you're the only one I know that could help me. So we've got a young man who came in third shift. Trying to run production, all of a sudden, he lays down on the floor, rolls around, <laughs> speaking in tongues, and told us all that he was having a, a Holy Spirit experience. Stephen, what do you think about that? First off, if I would have blew, blew him off earlier and not cared about a harvest, he'd have never called me in the office to begin with to tell him about this other. But because I had shown him some wisdom and I was obedient to the harvester, come on, somebody. He opened a door for me to speak to his life. And you know what I told him about that young man? I said, it's a spirit, but it probably ain't the Holy Spirit. You probably need to let him go. Because let me tell you something, folks. If you're crazy before you receive Christ, you're just Christ crazy when you get done. We've seen a lot of stuff that's been called Holy Ghost, and it's a lot, but it ain't a Holy Ghost. Let me tell you. 
and there's reason and rhyme and there's respect and there's honor. All I'm saying is, family, is when we get to be like Peter and we care about the harvest, we'll talk to the people we thought we'd never speak to, and some sides we thought we would join, we may have to stand in the middle and say, Lord Jesus, help me. Because it's about the harvest. I can say I'm harvesting, but if my sickle is not coming through the harvest, I'm not really harvesting. I'm going to close with this this morning. One day, 3,000 souls were convicted, pricked in their heart. In Hawkins County, we have 55,000, give or take, in the county. I know it's changing. 6,000 in the city. But on any given Sunday, less than 85% of those will ever attend church, ever. But what if 3,000 souls in Hawkins County gets their hearts pricked this morning? What if somebody that's watching this on Facebook and they hear the gospel again and the excuse gets ripped away because we built this fear triangle? Oh, they won't accept me. Oh, they won't love me. Oh, it won't be. But then the Holy Spirit moves and they begin to step. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit will lead you a lot of places, but he won't lead you to save yourself. I'm not going to drop it. It costs too much. Amen. <laughs> 3,000 souls got added to the church. 3,000 souls then went to their own individual communities and began to tell about this Jesus and that this Jesus was alive and well. And now this sect called Christians who had been heralded and rednecked and all this a few moments ago. Now guess what? Churches begin. This is the springboard. They call it the church of Philippi and Ephesus and Thessalonica, Colossae. Come on somebody. This is where the other churches came from. Because somebody was full of the spirit and saw the harvest. Let's stand to our feet. Pastor Raphael, would you come? Maybe you say this morning, but Brother Kimry, I, I, you know, I just want to get, I want to do enough to get by. Okay. But I'm glad somebody in my life didn't want to just do enough to get by. I'm glad I had somebody in my life who cared enough to walk up to Stephen Kimry. And although I was raised in a Christian home, I didn't live it when I got to school. I cared enough about Stephen Kimry to remind him who he is in Jesus. I'm thankful that somebody was so harvest minded that when I was at Bridges Chapel Church of God, and they might have been two people in my Sunday school class. They were so harvest-minded, they kept on teaching anyway. I'm so thankful that there were people around me that were so harvest-minded. That although they might not have been, quote, qualified or impressed somebody else, they kept faithful. Because the harvest was plentiful. As every head would bow and every eye would close. First thing I want to ask, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice here this morning, this whole day is about you. But Jesus came and God sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him, though you may be in the sinful harvest, maybe you've been in the field of sin so long, Maybe you feel like you're hopeless and helpless and nobody ever wants you. But Pentecost means He cares so much about you that He sent the empowerment of heaven so that men and women could represent Christ. And that this message this morning could come to you to remind you that if heaven, if you were the only one, heaven would have still emptied for you. Because God didn't send His only begotten Son into the world to condemn it, but that the whole world through Him might be saved. It's harvest, family. It's harvest.
Is there anybody under the sound of my voice this morning? Just simply raise your hand where you stand and say, Brother Stephen, I need Jesus. I need to be harvested this morning. Would you just raise your hand? God sees these hands. Amen. God sees these hands and understands. Maybe you say, Brother Stephen, I'm, I'm part of the harvest, but man, I, I've never won a soul to Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I, I like feeling good, but I really have never thought much about going and telling somebody else about him. I've been afraid, I've been scared, I've been apprehensive, but I want the Holy Spirit to empower me so that I too can be a harvester. If that's you, raise your hand where you stand. Hands going up everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, God, for all that you do and all that you are. God, we thank you, God, that you are the Lord of the harvest. And God, the Bible says to pray. You said pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. And God, I know this church, every member, every person, every participant, God, let us be your harvesters. Let us be, God, your laborers. God, let us get the sickles off the wall. God, help us get the, the harvesting tools off the walls of our life and again put them to use for the kingdom of heaven because souls are worth it. God, could we be committed to bankrupt heaven? God, to actually depopulate hell this morning. God, can we speak your word in power but in love, in wisdom but yet in direction that somebody might come to the saving knowledge of you. God, when it's all said and done, you will not brag on us how we have shouted. You will not brag on us, God, and how we have spoken unknown tongues. But God, it will please your heart when we lead somebody, somebody to you. Somebody to you, Jesus. Come on, Brother Kip. Il otot ka bus situ baka ki tunte fedeli amuka. Il lun pere de situ te kara metu ta la le kunti tu bari umutu. E dande de kapata si usutu ti amute le te kenuli ata kaduri umuta e se fondi ka tare le to kabari. Usu kudari amade ki hene. Ula ta kero va ta patuta. I sonde re kuta re mi tuta i lutu misikala e kuta re ria u tonde re 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 bitu kuta ria u tonde re re bonte. Oh, my children, know you not that I have preferred you, that I have looked into your eyes, into your heart, and I've thought of the good things that is available to not only to you but to the kingdom. Know you not that those that put aside evil, I will stop those things that beset you and hinder you from becoming, becoming and being what I've called you to be. Set them to the side, and I will give you gifts that will propel you into the harvest. That will propel you into life. That will propel you into a godly family. That will propel you over victory over your enemies. That will propel you in financial success. Success. Set them aside. They hold you back. And I have gifts to give. For my love for you is undying. My heart is continually about you. To those God that I, that I have given the gift, stir up the gifts that are within you. Stir them up and be relentless in the pursuit of your God and the pursuit of the harvest. Don't worry about what they're going to think if you let the gifts go. Know you not that the gifts will make your gifts will make room for you. That the anointing that I put upon you will propel you into positions and places and, and into people's lives that you never thought would happen. For I am the Lord thy God. I have prepared them to receive from you. But if you speak not, who shall hear? For the harvest is truly great. 
that's truly white to those that may not know me now is the time now is the time to cuddle and hurdle and cuddle around me be around me and you'll see the goodness that I have for you that I will do the expected things that in an unexpected way I will set your children free your home your family will prosper but set aside those things that beset you and remember this that the harvest must be won for surely I shall come back and surely I will take you and where I am you will be also run unto me for I am the Lord thy God who loveth thee Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Let's sing this morning. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Oh, your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. God is good and all the time. All right, laborers, it's time to go to work. Amen. Praise the Lord. Dinner bells rung. We want to just encourage you that uh, tonight, too, at 5 o'clock, if you'd come and join us, that would be wonderful. Bring plenty of water. It's going to be warm. Bring your lawn chairs. We're going to bring a little pop-up tent, amen, and some things like that. But that begins at 5 o'clock, and you don't want to miss it. I'm telling you, family, last time we got to go, our dear precious brother received the baptism, and we were so thankful for that, amen. And we know that God is going to do some great things tonight, not because of us, but because when we come united, God does great things. Amen. So don't forget that. Also, Tuesday night, 630, our family Bible study here with Brother James. Amen. Don't want to miss that. And, uh, and I believe that's all we've got going on this week. Is that right? Amen. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. We love and appreciate each and every one of you. Let me pray over you before you go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts, Lord. We thank you, God, for the empowerment, Lord. But God, we pray this morning as we look around us, God, that we won't just see people, but we'll see souls. And God, that we'll be people of harvest. That God, that you'll stir in us and encourage us, God, to make the effort to save and to help one person come to the saving knowledge of you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Can we all say? Amen. Amen. Smile.